Welcome all to Pear. Pear, stage is yours. Thank you, Thomas. I, I looked at an article the other day preparing for this talk, uh, meshedinsights.com, and it's actually 25 years ago since Sun established the OSPO, give or take. I'm, I was not part of it, but that's the, that's the history. And so um, I was reading what they were supposed to be doing, the definition of the OSPO at Sun 25 years ago, and they said it's a cross-company oversight of anything related to open source, using open source code, working with open source communities, establishing new open source projects, and shipping projects built from parts under open source licenses, acting as an interface between the many open source communities of interest and the corporation. That's very much how we describe an OSPO today. Like, nothing has really changed. It has been very static of how we describe OSPOs. It might not be what we do, but it's how we see ourselves and how we communicate to the outside world about this is what an OSPO does, this is the value that it brings. So that was really the foundation of, of putting this talk together that it's very rare that anything in tech stays the same for 25 years. That can't be true. And so um, I put together a bunch of thoughts here. And as I go through it, it might feel like doom and gloom that we're heading towards something that might be negative for the OSPO. But I also just want to make sure that everyone understands that it's, it's out of very much a respect for what the OSPOs have done so far and out of an utmost respect of what open source is. Uh, but also with the thought that we really need to continue to evolving and we can't keep saying the same thing we've been doing for 25 years because the world is very different today than it was 25 years ago. So it's an attempt of, of triggering those conversations. Um, I might look very serious, doomy and gloomy in my face, but that's just how my face looks. So I'm sorry about that. I can't do anything about it. I can smile for like two seconds without getting a headache. So anyways, um, just very quickly about me. Um, I'm currently the director of developer programs at Docker. What I'm saying here has nothing to do with Docker. I don't represent my employer and all that. Uh, before that, I spent 10 years building a sustainable open source company called Umbraco. Uh, did content management system. It was sold to an equity fund a couple of years ago. And then I've been head of product security at Zalando, also managing open source and uh, open source tech lead at Spotify. So. <sighs> First, we'll just go to like, how did we get here? Like, how did uh, open source succeed from an OSPO perspective? Like, the road to open source victory. Um, we didn't do it alone, so there's a lot of friends we made along the way. So let's just look at those as well. And then I think the crucial part, which we also see in the last couple of years, is like, victory does not equal job security. And then where do we go from here? So that's the highlights. So, um, yeah, I already said this. Again, <laughs> I don't represent my uh, employer, and I'm not trying to piss anyone off, off here. So, okay, this is the number we all love. Like 96% of all software contains open source, so we can all agree that open source has been a success. It has been great. Uh, over at least my involvement in open source, we've, we went from cancer to business critical. So that's, um, that's a big success on the business side, that we are no longer talking about open source being dangerous, but actually it is dangerous in the way that it's in our most critical business systems. That's how it's dangerous today. Um, also, it went from like cutting edge. This used to be a thing that companies said they were open source to be cool and to attract employees. It's now just a commodity. If, if an engineer goes to a tech company today and say, nah, we don't do open source, then they seriously reconsider if they even want to work there. It's table stakes for most companies today to say they are actually at least accepting open source. So we've also come a long way there. Uh, I love that Microsoft uh, went out and said they love Linux, and I love that OpenAI, which is the most popular company right now, previously claimed to be open source, which is not. Um, so that's how far we've come. So um, we didn't do it alone. We, as OSPOs, did a lot of work inside of organizations to get us to this point where we can say these wonderful things about open source and how the perspective of open source changed. So if we look at an organization 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we had this fear of open source. And we had a bunch of stakeholders in there. These are the same stakeholders we talk about today. We talk about business or tech leadership. We talk about these risk teams, which is broadly like legal, security, compliance. And we talk about engineering, or engineers specifically. Like, leadership had a vague idea of what it was. It was dangerous. Uh, legal was generally like fearful of it. They didn't really understand what it would mean to say yes or no. Um, so there was very much this like, bottleneck of legal having to approve everything. 
um, security had a view of they didn't really understand this frame because they, they couldn't get like documentation from an open source project and they also didn't like that people could see the code because they were more like insecure. And engineering, very positive, but they also they needed to be enabled to kind of understand how to actually do this. They couldn't just like, you can't just like copy code and put it in your product. You need to understand the process. Um, and also some companies were just like, well, we are like a Microsoft house, so we are like an Oracle house, so we only use the stuff from those vendors. So, um, so Ospos had a real reason to work with these stakeholders, and we did a lot of things to bring them along the way. Uh, a broad oversight, uh, engineering, really helping them on adoption, shipping, how do you open source your code, how do you do upstream contributions. Um, for legal and risk and security and compliance teams, it was very much like, how do we get to a yes? Um, how do you understand that there is no paperwork? You can't get a contract from an open source project and that's okay. Um, how do you work with a supply chain? How do you even understand as a security team that you're not buying a piece of software, you don't have an SLA on it, you have to just actually start doing something yourself to keep it secure. You can't just wait for a vendor to pass the thing. It was all changing the culture and changing the expectations. If you are a security team, you're used to getting your software from Oracle, then it's a very different experience of getting it from GitHub. It's a very different thing. So that's a, that's a primary thing of what Ospos did was really to get to these points where there was an understanding that this was fundamentally different and bring them along the way. Um, for leadership, uh, getting the buy-in, uh, and I think a lot of praise for the first person who was like, yes, let's, let's change the Microsoft SQL Server into MySQL for this like, very critical business system. But that was really the first step because before that, open source was considered a toy. It was something that businesses generally like, yeah, we can use it for like small stuff, but then it just moved into the very critical business systems and that's very natural today. Um, and then also allowing employees to do open source, a big step as well for companies, and then also understanding that open source is more than just free stuff you can get from the internet. It was actually a way to position yourself, it was actually a way to have influence, get part of the roadmap, integrate yourself into the communities and that could lead to, well, promotion of your company, a good hiring funnel as well, and so on and so on. And that's all like Ospos who did that inside of companies to get to that point. So again, if we look at the, um, the stakeholders, the Ospo was placed in the middle, and we were kind of the dotted line between all of these things, making sure that these stakeholders started talking to each other and kind of connected the dots about like how was open source valuable. So that was, the, that was the kind of the path to, to, you could say, open source victory. We upskilled the organizations, we made them capable of managing open source, and we managed to make open source something as boring as business as usual, and that meant we won. That is, that is how victory looks like. It is, there's nothing special about open source, and that is actually the victory. So, um, at the same time, victory does not equal job security, as I think we've all found out the last couple of years. So, um, we've had tech layoffs the last couple of years, and I think maybe it's just me being biased, being in this like OSPO ecosystem, but a lot of OSPO teams and open source functions was hit hard here. Like entire teams managed. Like Google laid off their head of open source and most of the team. And if you go to LinkedIn today, I did this a week ago, so I don't know if it's accurate anymore, but if you search for like OSPO jobs, open source program office roles, you get zero results. There's nothing there. So how come we have like a streak of victories getting from cancer to business criticality and then the function just goes away? It is practically gone right now. It might come back, but we don't really know. Um, so to kind of get to that, uh, let's just go back a year and see, again, the business value of the OSPO. This was released a year ago in March 2023. Um, it's, a good, it's a good report. Um, but again, we go into this thing of like, what is the business OSPO value? And that's the black square in the upper left corner for me, right for you. Um, we drive compliance, standardization, reputation, knowledge sharing, development, speed, security, and sustainability. It's the exact same thing as the Sun OSPO was 25 years ago. There's no evolution, it is the same. Um, but in the meantime, the world has changed radically. All the things I just outlined is not just like open source victories, it's also changes to the world around us. So that means that we can't keep saying the stuff we said 25 years ago because the world, I'm sorry, doesn't care. 
like the world doesn't care about what an OSPO does anymore because the world is totally capable of doing it by itself. Um, because if we look at our org charts, um, then engineering, engineers has an abundance of hands-on open source experience now in most organizations. There's no need for cheerleaders. There's no, there's no need to go convince an engineer that open source is okay or fine. Uh, because they're already managing systems that is based on open source. They're using open source code already, or they have friends that do it, or they look at GitHub. Like, they inform themselves. They go to conferences where people talk about open source. There's not very many engineers in this world that do not, uh, who are not positive about open source. Um, thanks to organizations like GitHub and ironically Microsoft, uh, we have better open source tooling than ever. And also, if you go look at any engineering job ad, it's one of the most desired skills you can have as an engineer. So this is also something that people have as top of mind as they go into their studies and try to level up from a junior to senior, is to get open source experience and experience with specific open source projects. And that also means that tech leadership has changed. It means that they, they start defining strategic bets on open source. They actually have an opinion in leadership about should we go with Kafka? Should we go with Redis? Should we consider MongoDB? This is something that is now on a strategic level in organization. It's not something that people dabble in. It is actually strategic decisions. Um, that means that they drive something as a tech radar, they set golden paths, they set standards, ways of working for engineering on a strategic level, and it all involves open source. They're totally aware of this thing existing. Um, they drive the tech stack, it's primarily open source. Um, and of course, they also have a balance between like, what should we build, what should we buy, what should be cloud, what should we have as open source, what should we open source ourselves. That is now an actual, like, that is actual leadership discussions in companies who have adopted open source. And it's all good. Um, legal, any lawyer you talk to today knows what open source is. They're not surprised about the topic anymore. They don't just automatically say no anymore. Security. Thanks to well, Log4j and OpenSSF, every security team on the planet now knows that they need to take uh, open source and supply chain very seriously, and they are investing. Um, same thing with compliance as well. Um, so it just means that also all these teams also have better tooling than ever as well. Like any security team who wants to deal with the topic of open source security, they have 20 different vendors to pick from. They don't need knowledge. They can get it from the tools themselves. I know you're shaking your head, Thomas. You can ask questions later. <laughs> so at the same time, we also have big trends, how organizations organize themselves. We have a big bet on platform engineering. We have a big bet on shifting security left, enabling engineers to make decisions out of tooling, automation, scanning that happens at the engineering side. Um, we have a big focus on creating autonomous teams. That means that they can't wait for legal, they can't wait for security, and they can't wait for an OSPO. Um, we also have a shift to cloud native uh, as well. So all these things mean that we have fundamentally changed how teams collaborate and build software together. So, and then of course we also have this more negative thing that we have reduced hiring needs and we have reduced growth in tech in general, uh, which also impacts how we think about open source as well. Like we see very few companies coming out now and say using open source to hire people because they don't have that much of a need anymore to do that. So, when we talked about OSPOs five, six, seven years ago, also even in that report from last year, what most of the OSPOs actually saw in their future was that we saw an expansion of the OSPO from doing tactical things. I think at the time the report was made, um, we were like, yeah, compliance, security, that is table stakes. Everyone should be able to do that. And we should see an expansion of OSPOs into driving strategy and influencing the organization as a whole. So expansion reach into our stakeholders, leadership, legal, engineering, and so on. Um, so that was what we thought would be happening. Um, but again, if we look at those things that the report mentions about compliance, bridging the gap between corp and open source, inner source, owning the open source strategy, um, then again, that, those changes to the organizations, as I showed you before, also has an impact on that. Like, for compliance, legal, and so on, this is, this is table stakes. We already know that they have the upskill. They're upskilled, they know enough. They have an abundance of tools. And again, uh, autonomous teams are unable to choose their own stacks within a certain limit. And there's tooling in place to actually ensure that that works. You don't need a support team to actually tell them how to do it. Uh, bridging the cooperation with open source projects. In 
what I've seen and what I've observed in organizations is that engineering teams who are deeply engaged in, for instance, working with Kafka on the internal side, these are also the people who manage the relationship. They speak engineer to engineer, project maintainers to internal maintainers. And that's, that's the direct path now. There's no need for like a support function to kind of help people send an email or reach out to them on, on GitHub. The, the, the conversation happens without anyone helping it. Um, and again, open source as a hiring driver is over. The vanity projects are gone. Those projects that were not vanity projects are now maintained by teams who actually have a business function to maintain them because the company also uses them internally. So it's driven by a business need, and there's not really, an OSPO is not needed to guide them along. For inner sourcing, inner sourcing is an interesting thing. It really depends on how your organization looks like, but with the drive toward platform teams owning a lot of the shared real estate inside organizations, and also again with like smaller teams who own like very narrow things such as microservices, there are less reasons to actually do inner source, source. Because everything that's shared between the teams typically transition into the platform unit who will manage these things. And small autonomous teams don't want external dependencies, like waiting for a different team to update something they're depending on. They want to be able to drive fast, that's why they keep things narrow and slim. So starting to inner source things actually goes directly against a lot of that mantra in these like very slim teams. If you have a different organizations, different story, but if you go in the trend of like microservices and platform, then inner source is actually very hard to get working because you don't want the shared ownership. You want fast, small teams standing on top of a big shared foundation. And again, this is also driven by like leadership. This is a strategic investment from leadership to actually do this. So it's very hard to go in and say, well, we want to do inner source, but if the strategy is platform and micro teams, then that goes that there's a there's a tension and a conflict between those two things. So, and then owning the open source strategy. Like an OSPO can own an open source strategy, but also just have to accept that open source is a key part of any IT strategy now. Open source is a key part of any security strategy. Open source is part of role expectations for engineers, engineering managers. Open source is embedded into what platform teams are supposed to do. It's embedded into a tech radar for most companies. So what is actually left? And again, this is, this is common. This is based on trends. And I have 10 minutes left, thank you. Um, so what is actually left? Well, what has happened, instead of that big OSPA ball, we actually see a small OSPA ball. Our stakeholders, the friends we made along the way, got so excited about open source and saw the criticality of open source that they actually expanded their influence on the topic. And this is actually a good thing. It's a great thing that company leadership feel that open source is so important. It's a great thing that legal compliance and security really prioritizes open source. Um, it's a great thing that engineering has this part of its role expectations. So open source knowledge has become the norm very much thanks to OSPRO's work. Open source has become business critical, very much thanks to what OSPROs have been doing inside of organizations. And it also became too important to just be managed by a small team of two to three people. It needed to go up into the actual primary functions of the organization and not be part of, you could say, a support team. So this is also part of becoming business critical and business as usual. So, um, where do we go from here? So I think first of all, I think going back to this thing of like, we've had the same definition for 25 years. I think we need to either like keep evolving the narrative of what an OSPO is, actually start rethinking this because the world has changed. Um, think about how you create novel value as an OSPO, or maybe the option is to actually integrate this because you can see there's a lot of in stakeholders in an organization now that does what an OSPO used to do. So maybe that's where the OSPO is gonna live in the future. Uh, I'm not here to give job advice, um, but there's still a long tail of companies out there who have not made the jump into open source and are still like very much considering all these things I'm talking about. Again, my perspective here is working with companies who have been doing open source for the last like 10 years, so they're in a different place. It's a very specific point of view, um, but there's a trend towards this. Um, so um, there's a long tail uh, who are, of companies who have been hesitant to doing this, there is also a growing ecosystem of companies who are purely open source, who doesn't have open source as a side gig, but is actually producing open source. Um, so it's just like a type of tree sitting down here. 
<laughs> and um, there is also the skills for OSPO there. Maybe this is where OSPO folks are going to end up. Um, and then there's the interesting part of moving up the value chain, because there is fundamental challenges in open source. I'm not saying all is well. Like we have maintainer burnout, we have a lack of diversity among maintainers, we have challenges with project sustainability, funding, and so on, which are topics that is bigger than the individual organization. And there is still like a lot of room there for us both to actually go in and influence where we're going um, and being a voice in that conversation as well, and actually start uh, addressing that and being like a novel voice again in this thing. And then, of course, there's the integration part, joint forces with platform, work on productizing and scaling the ops, ops per work. So, there was a maybe doomy and gloomy. I'm sorry about that. But I think, I think the, just the, to end like on a positive note, I think this is, this is really positive for the world. It might not be positive for the OSPOs. I don't know. I don't know where, where the topic of OSPOs are going to go in the future. But I think, like looking back, when I started uh, producing open source, it was called the cancer. But at the same time, I was also part of the first line of businesses who actually made it into a sustainable business by offering something for free. Uh, and then open source outgrew us. And we had to actually stop talking about open source because everyone was, and we actually had to start talking about business value. Um, I've been part of shutting down in OSPO twice, simply because the company didn't need it. Like They were perfectly capable of doing this themselves. So again, open source outgrew us locally there. Um, and so I think the last couple of years is just an indicator that maybe open source has just outgrown the OSPO as it is defined today, and we need to refine it. We need to reinvent it and see um, maybe the future doesn't include OSPOs, or maybe it doesn't include OSPOs as they look today. Um, but it will definitely include open source, because open source is more important than ever. And with that, um, thank you for listening. Okay, any questions? Maybe less of a question, but uh, a, an observation. So what you said about OSPO is essentially the job is to make yourself redundant and transfer the skill into everybody else's abilities. That actually is one definition for architects. And once upon a time, I was really proud to work as a systems architect till I realized that my job is actually to teach everybody else to have that skill, making my own job obsolete. Well, I turned to, out to be a product owner for platform engineering in the end, so that was okay. But uh, I think the idea is the same. The best way to do the job is make everybody be able to do the job well enough. And that's okay. It's a temporary nature. And like your own success is kind of doing the next thing. Thank you. Good, good talk, really. Thank you, and very, very much true what you say. It is important about making yourself redundant. Uh, yeah, so just adding to what Shlomo said, it's really interesting because, you know, as a good manager, as a good uh, product owner or whatever, you, you're trying to make yourself obsolete. I, I, I like the thought, so thanks for the input that, you know, as an OSPO, we try to make ourselves obsolete by putting our organizations into the spot that they can do the work themselves without imposing risks and so forth and so forth, yeah. Okay, but uh, one question on one of your slides, you said create novel value, you know, thereby justifying your existence again as an OSPO. Any thoughts on what could be the novel value for OSPOs for in an organization that's already quite mature? Yeah, that, if I knew that, I would have put it on a slide. <laughs> I, think it, I, think it's very, I think it's very organizationally dependent here, and I think, uh, I think my view here is not being stuck in how we've used to define this for the last 25 years, but actually start moving outside of that. And I think the suggestions for it before, like how do we keep projects sustainable, how do we ensure funding, maintain sustainability, sustainability, maintain a burnout, like all those things are already something that can do, and I think... Um, one challenge also is how do you work with HR and open source? Like that's an interesting topic because if you look at it, maintainer diversity, if you look at uh, what is actually maybe causing that is like employees at tech companies always they don't always get like dedicated time off to actually work on on open source, and so the people at companies working on open source ends to end up being the people working on open source in the weekends, and these those people tend to be white dudes in their twenties. 
not women in their 30s who also have two kids and a very lazy husband who are doing JavaScript all weekend. So they can't do it. Like so, um, so there is like there is these like more fundamental systems further down that I think we haven't talked about at all. And there I think there's plenty of room to grow. But that means that we need to step out of the, the predefined definition. Yeah, I think you know what you're talking about. Uh, I, I go around and, and say that you know open source has not won. Uh, it's uh, I think a, a question of the definition of done. Uh, in some way, uh, I think OSPOs probably can can still have a, a strong role also in developing countries. Uh, and to put it uh, very tabloid, uh, you know, we we have to be very careful. Uh, you know, yes, the Roman Empire was run by slaves, but that doesn't mean that they won, right? Uh, <laughs> It's a good analogy, though. <laughs> so now it's a good thing of being a host myself. And now I can ask my own question, because you said, yes, I, I'll go critique. Um, you said there are lots of tools available. Uh, somebody who tracks about, God knows, 150 plus, I think now 183 OSPO tools. Yes, there are lots of tools available. Yes, the vendors promise magical wands and glass balls to sort out all the thing. Uh, but the th sad thing is that most of the things don't work <laughs> to the point that several OSPOs, especially here in the German automotive company, have, are basically actively working together to actually build tools that work. So yeah, there is a lot of tools that you can buy, but there's also so much crap or tools out of which one you pick. Yep. So what's your response to that? What do you pick? Um, let me just check who gives me kickback here on the thing. Uh, no, so that's a good question. It's, it's definitely also, I think, the curse of the expert is to see people picking up these like, oh, this is so rudimentary, this is so simple, can't you see all the mistakes you're making because I am the expert here, I see all the nuances. Um, but I think for organizations, what matters is just doing a good enough job to be compliant and just check the box. That is also part of business as usual, I'm sorry. Uh, so. So in these teams who are like managing this thing just as a thing they need to do, the passion is not there. They don't care about the details as long as it, it's good enough. That's that's where it is. And if you look at like if you look at ISO frameworks, if you look at NIST and so on, they have a definition of what is good enough, and that's what companies are going to do. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that is the, that is reality of also business as usual. Um, that they just off the shelf tool. It might do 80% of the stuff. That's good enough. I can tell you it's much lower. <laughs> it's much, Fair. much, Fair. much 80% was very optimistic, I'm sorry. <laughs> Especially if you do container stuff. I also think it's a bit polemic to say that. The, <laughs> but I have a question about the sustainability of open source itself. I think I understand that OSPO is a way to find sustainability in open source and have a actually wealth uh, relationship. Um, and. I want to hear your thoughts more about, because you mentioned that it is part of everyone's job basically now, but in my experience is that most of the people do not actually can define properly what open source is. They are worried about compliance. So the question is, um, by not having more OSPOs, um, are the companies just not making the funding for it? But how would you see that healthy relationship and the proper maintenance and compliance in two years when the OSPOs are gone in that perspective? That's a good question. I think on the on the funding part, when we have we have we have already elevated open source to be part of the strategic discussions around like what what do companies depend on. And by doing that, we are actually much closer to a much bigger budget than you see down in an OSPRO, there's like two or three people yelling about sustainability. So I feel this is an evolution, and this is where OSPOs, I think, can play a part, is that, oh, you have Kafka as like a critical part of your business, you actually have it as part of your strategy, that you want to build whatever on it, <coughs> you should make sure that that stays sustainable. And that's actually something that the risk team should actually address. This is actually a risk reduction to pay these people so it doesn't go away. So we're not, we don't actually have to talk about sustainability, we have to talk about risk reduction. Um, because if you depend on something that doesn't have funding, you're taking an enormous risk. And that is, 
also terrible, but it's sometimes how the conversation goes inside of companies about funding. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Might not like it, but yeah. Unfortunately, we ran out of time there. So thank you for your great talk. Thank if you, you want to speak, you're around, right? I'm around, yeah. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. All right.